All right, now let's talk about these two virtues. These two virtues, I mean, this is what's going to keep you from your downfall. Like, if, if Solomon had practiced these two virtues, his story would have gone completely different. In fact, if Bill Hybels and Robbie Zacharias and all those people that I named earlier in the message, if they would have practiced these two virtues, their narrative would have gone drastically different. I mean, the truth is, in the next five years, there are some of you in the room that you're going to have a big falling out with, with your work, with your family, with a friend. You're going to make some decision, and it's, it's not going to go well. But if you will start practicing these two virtues today, I'm telling you, you will rewrite the story of your life. So here's the first one. Accountability. David had it. He accepted it. Like, I don't, I don't care how successful you are, how talented you are. You can make the most money for your company. You can have the most zeros in your bank account. You can be the person that they're trying to write articles about you because you're just so good at what you do. Like, I, I, don't, I don't care how successful you are at what you do. If you don't have somebody in your life who's holding you accountable to some kind of a Christian ethic, you're going to fall. Like, when people get a little bit of power, they start to like that power. And the more you like power, the more you distance yourself from your friends and from people who can speak truth to you. And so if you push those people away, you're going to fall. Our reading this morning comes from Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates it, meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I wouldn't call myself a tree enthusiast or anything, but I spent some time just this past week sitting down and talking with Neil Arter a little bit about the trees over on OC's campus. Some of you probably remember a time when there weren't many trees on that campus, maybe like two. Like there weren't that many, and so over the last I don't know, 50 years, this campus has really grown in so many ways, and I got an opportunity to talk to Neil about that a little bit. Um, I think it was probably 12 or 13 years ago, I got to help. There was an opportunity for OC to plant hundreds of trees on their campus, and we planted some all over, and I got to plant one right outside the admissions office at OC. And I want you to know that I was working in the admissions office at that time, and every single day I planted this tree, and every single day I went out there and I watered it with a can of Mountain Dew. I'm not kidding. And I want you to know, for the longest time, that tree was one of the most thriving trees on that campus. And so there is something good from Mountain Dew. I want you to know that right now. Somebody in that crowd is like, thank you, I needed that right now. No, but I got to talk to Neil a little bit. That campus has grown in so many ways in just its beauty. Um, If you're from other parts of the world, you might think, well, that's hardly trees. Like, that's not that much. But I just want you to know, some incredible things have happened over there with their trees. I know a group from Cascade College got to plant some trees there at one point. There's part of the survivor tree from Oklahoma City there, and also another part of a tree. And Neil, I'm telling you, Neil can tell you a whole lot more than I'm telling you right now. It's part of a tree from where the Twin Towers were in New York City. There's just some really cool and fascinating trees there in that, on that campus. It's amazing how it's grown, and it's amazing how many different types of trees there are right here next door to us. Uh, this morning we're talking about trees. We are talking about trees, and there are some pretty impressive trees out there. And just for the sake of no reason at all, I now just want to like look at the greatest trees in film history, all right? So we're going to look at the greatest trees in film history. 
just so you know, there's a lot of types of trees out there. We got the Whomping Willow in Harry Potter. We got that tree from Forrest Gump. I mean, that's all I know about it. We got the apple trees from the Wizard of Oz. Scary, but good. Of course, the Swiss Family Robinson tree house. Who could forget that one? Um, probably the most iconic in my mind, the bonsai tree in Karate Kid Part 3. Nobody knows what is happening right now in this one. And then, of course, the tree in Charlie Brown's Christmas. Who could forget that one? And last but not least, Groot in Guardians of the Galaxy. It was a tree. Trees are pretty fascinating. Once you start thinking about the different types of trees and all that there are, man, it's really cool. But also, trees are pretty significant in the story of the Bible. And if you have time, I would really encourage you to listen to the Bible Project podcast episode called Humans Are Trees. And here in this episode, they talk about so many significant moments in the Bible where humans and trees are together. At some of the major hinge points in the story of Scripture, there we find trees. From the first pages of Scripture, we have tree. In the garden, to the very last pages of Scripture in the book of Revelation, we have trees. And the tree of life. And so you probably could spend a lot of time this week just thinking about trees and doing a deep dive in Scripture. And I promise you will be amazed by just the, how many trees there are in Scripture. This morning, in your Bible classes, we're going to talk about the book of Psalms. We're going to talk about the book of Psalms. And I just want you to know that every time I read the book of Psalms, I can't help but think of the life of a tree. Because the tree is there day after day in every season of life, faithful to its purpose, no matter what the world and its elements bring, there is the tree. And as you read the book of Psalms, on one hand, it is a book of praise and hope and goodness. But on the other hand, it is a difficult read. There are moments in the book of Psalms where there is heartbreak and there is anger as the psalmist cries out to God. And so I love this book because it is a beautiful picture of the life of a tree just continually there in every season, faithful to its purpose. And that's especially why I love Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, where the psalmist describes the image of a tree. And so I want to spend a little time in Psalm chapter 1 this morning. Grab your Bibles if you haven't already opened to it. Open up to Psalm chapter 1. We're going to spend some time there this morning. This is one of the verses that we have committed to memorization here at Memorial Road this year. And so there's a chance there are some of you in this crowd who already know this verse very well. You've thought about it deeply. And we're going to do that just for a minute here. And I think one of the reasons we've chose to memorize this verse is because there's a lot we can learn from this very short psalm. So let's let's begin. We're just going to read Psalm chapter 1 one more time. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction." And so there's this beautiful image here in Psalm chapter 1. You've probably read it at some point in time before. But I just want to begin with the very first word of this psalm, blessed. I just want to begin with the very first word of this psalm, blessed, because I believe that God intentionally orchestrated the book of Psalms so that when you open it up, the very first word you read and the very first thought in your head is this word, blessed. Because here in the book of Psalms and here in Psalm chapter 1, man, we discover that there is such thing as a blessed life. 
And Psalm chapter 1 is going to teach us how to be right with God and thrive in life. And I love the image of this tree in Psalm chapter 1. Have you thought about the image of this tree in Psalm chapter 1? Let's just look at it again. It is prosperous in all it does. Well, first, it's, I'm sorry, it is a tree planted by streams of water. It is a tree planted by streams of water. You know, it's constantly near this life-giving source. It is yielding fruit in season, so there is producing something day after day, year after year. Its leaf does not wither. Therefore, you know, like when those difficult seasons happen and those hardships come, here is this tree. And then, of course, whatever they do prospers. It almost sounds like the writer of Psalm chapter 1 is imagining some magical tree that can do unbelievable things. But see, I don't think that's what the writer of Psalms is trying to say. In fact, I think what he is saying is that the abundant life is possible. That it is possible to be right with God and to thrive in life. And isn't that what you want for your life? Isn't that what you want for your family and for your children? Man, isn't that what you want for this church? That we would experience a thriving and fulfilling and abundant life? That we would be right with God? Don't you want to be like the tree in Psalm 1? Stable, strong, nourished, fruitful, experiencing renewal day in and day out, no matter the season of life, prosperous in all that we are doing. Now, I'll be honest, I think that there are a lot of people in this room who are chasing down this life. You are chasing down this blessed life, but I also think a lot of us are falling short. Day after day, year after year, we keep falling short, and I think the reason is we keep looking in all of the wrong places. We have searched every other way in the world to find the blessed life. And and the writer of Psalm chapter 1, he's going to point to where the blessed life truly is found. And so I want to talk about that here for just a minute. But before we move forward, I just want to give you a warning. Actually, I want to give you two warnings. First is that the blessed life might not be the life that you've got planned for yourself right now. I don't want you to get the wrong idea of blessing and being prosperous in this life. And I think what we're going to discover in Psalm chapter 1 is that blessing is so much more about what we experience through God and through His Word than what we get from God. And so that's the first warning I give you. The second warning is this, that before you move forward in striving to find a blessed life, I just want you to know it comes at a great cost. Literally, to live the abundant and thriving life that you want for yourself and for your family and for your relationships, it is going to literally cost you everything you have. Your time and your efforts, it's going to be a complete surrender of your life. And so if you're still with me, and I hope you are, let's look and see if we can discover the secret to the blessed life. It's not very complicated. You've heard this before. But look at the words again in verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. You know, it's interesting. Verse 1, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, doesn't begin with the image of where to find the blessed life. The very first words are not where this blessed life is found, but in fact, where this life is not found. And see, I think one of the reasons why the writer puts this first is because so many of us are guilty of thinking the blessed life is in every other path in this world. And he's saying, man, that's not the way to the blessed life. Let me just tell you before you even begin, that is not the way. Notice the progression in verse 1. I thought this was interesting. I, I don't think I'd ever thought about it before until I was working on this lesson. Notice the progression. The blessed person doesn't walk in step with the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way sinners take. He doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. And so there's this progression of walking, 
to standing, to sitting. We've all done this before. We've done this with really harmless things. We're in the grocery store, we see that aisle of snack foods, and we're like, I'm just gonna walk down the aisle. It's no big deal, it's just a way. We walk down the aisle, and then we're like, wow, they made nerd gummy clusters. This is incredible. And we're just locked in for a second. And before you know it, we have purchased all the candy that we've ever, we could ever eat in a lifespan. We're taking it with us. And this is what the writer of Psalm is trying to say, but on such a deeper and more destructive level, that it, you are not blessed when you begin that path where you walk and eventually you are tempted to stand and then eventually you are sitting there. In fact, I like what Christian author Ben Stewart notes about this. He says there's another progression. There's a progression of thinking to behaving, to belonging. What began as a thought turned into an action that you just walked along that way and then you were part of those actions to eventually you were fully associated with scoffers, people who make an absolute mockery of every sense of morality and righteousness. And we've all been there before. Haven't we all fallen guilty of this life before? In every ministry I've ever been a part of, I've told our students or adults, whoever I'm speaking to, I just told them time and time again, environment matters. Environment matters. It doesn't matter later in your life, it matters right now. And if you really want to experience spiritual growth, and if you really want to experience an abundant life, then you will position yourself in a place where you have the most potential for growth. You have to position yourself where you have the most potential for growth. So that means the company that you keep matters. The places you go matters. Your thoughts and even your feelings matter. The things you say matter. Your actions matter. Every little thing in your life and in your environment matters right now. And this is what the writer of Psalm 1 is trying to say. He's saying everything matters Be careful that you don't take this path. And so the first word that I would just encourage you to remember, if you really want to live a blessed life, is that you'll remember this word, plant. Plant. No matter who you are in this world, no matter who you are in life, whether you are wicked in all of your ways or you are righteous, eventually you will plant yourself somewhere. And so I would encourage you to plant yourself in a place where you have the most potential for growth. See, the blessed person has the wisdom to recognize that Satan does not want you planting yourself by streams of water. No, he wants you to wander the earth seeking every deceptive and destructive path so that he can convince you to plant yourself in something that is far less life-giving. And so... For the wicked, the the psalmist writes that they are like chaff. They're not like a tree. They're like chaff. And you don't have to know a lot about chaff this morning, but essentially like chaff is that husk that you see around the seed. Its purpose is super temporary and then it's gone. It has no nourishment or has no major value. It's just there and then it's gone and it's nothing. And so for the psalmist in Psalm chapter 1, he's saying, you are blessed when you, and we'll talk about that in a second, But you are not blessed when you follow this path of wickedness. In fact, you will always, he's really essentially saying, there are really only two paths in this world that you will take. For the wicked, they will wander the earth seeking every possible way eventually to plant themselves in something destructive. But for the righteous, and hear me here, before they ever take a step, Before they ever follow any path, they plant themselves in the word of the Lord. They plant themselves in the word of the Lord. And this is what verse 2 is all about. Look again at verse 2. Blessed is the one who delights, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night. There are a lot of things I delight in. Let's be honest with you. There are a lot of things I delight in. I delight in time with my two daughters. I delight in time with my wife. I delight in time with my friends. I got to do a little bit of that yesterday. I just really enjoyed my time. I delight in a hike 
in the mountains of Colorado. I delight, even though we know it's harmful, I delight in a Mountain Dew after I mowed the lawn on a summer day. I just love it. I crush that thing. It's just like boom and gone, done. I delight, I hate to say it, but you know what? I delight in a fantasy football victory every once in a while. Once in a while, I feel like I just delight and I just feel good about it. You probably have things that you delight in, but for the writer of Psalm chapter 1, listen to what the writer of Psalm chapter 1 says. Blessed is the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, when we think of law, you might think of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. But also the writer is saying, like, the the law is every teaching from the mouth of God. All of Scripture is the law of the Lord. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't think a lot of us delight in the law. I don't think a lot of us delight in commandments, and I think a lot of that has to do not with an issue with the law, but an issue with us. See, we have a really, really broken idea of what the law is about or what commandments of God are truly about. And so for the writer of Psalm chapter 1, his delight is in the law of the Lord because through it, he is discovering who God is and what he is about. See, when we, we delight in the law of the Lord, we're discovering that God is a God of justice for all people. And he's a God of compassion and forgiveness. He is a God who is faithful to his promise. He is a God who is using the goodness of his power for the goodness of your life. This is something to delight in. And in fact, I love what one author wrote. Timothy Keller said this about delighting in the law of the Lord. I love this. He said, Jesus is the only way to delight in the law. We see his life and how he responds to the law, and we delight in that. We also delight in the fact that Jesus took the curse that while we would forever be disobedient to the law, we would be made right through him. And that is something to delight in. Man, I think there's a lot that you can delight in when you surrender your life over to the law of the Lord, to the commandments of God, to the word of the Lord. And see, when you do that, even in the darkest moments, you are discovering that God is good and that God is faithful. But here's another thing you can't delight in. You can't just wake up one day and say, I'm just going to delight in the law of the Lord today then. You can't just do that if you aren't in the word of the Lord. And so you have to spend your life meditating on the word of the Lord day and night. And that's what the second part of this verse is about. So blessed is the person who delights in the law of the Lord, but also blessed is the person who meditates on the word of the Lord day and night. So we have like this, there's this idea of meditation. And for a lot of us, when we think of meditation, we think of like, removing everything from our brain. And there's a lot of like people today that tell you like meditation is all about just like removing everything from your brain and just like being at peace in this place. And there's a, there's a part for that. But Hebrew meditation, what the writer is talking about here, it's actually about taking the truths of scripture and then like just pressing them down into your heart. In fact, I heard somebody say it's like pressing them down into your heart until they catch fire. So Hebrew meditation, meditating on the word of the Lord is where you take the truths of scripture and you let it shape who you are. You are like the writer of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 who says that we let the word of God penetrate even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. And you're blessed when you do this because you are discovering God's purpose for you through that. You're breaking down all of the unhealthy walls in your heart and in your life so that God can show you something that is good and pure. The reality is, and I'm with you on this one here, I don't think there are a lot of us that have time to meditate on the word of the Lord. I don't think there are a lot of people in this room that have made time to meditate on the word of the Lord day and night, both constantly and methodically. We just got too much going on. We have too much going on, and the Word of God is competing with everything else in our lives. It is competing with work, and school, and sports, 
and your kids' sports and social media and Netflix and video games and every other thing out there that the world is throwing, the Word of God has to compete with this. Let me explain it to you this way. I think the Lord brought me to youth ministry for this reason. I eat like a junior high boy. I do. I love pizza and donuts, and you already know I like Mountain Dew. I like those things. And my wife says I'm like a child. In fact, whenever we have a really nice dinner somewhere, I am very picky. And I try not to be like a diva about it, but I'm picky. I'm like, what's that sauce that is just on this meat? We don't need that. And she's like, you are like a child. Just try it. And I'm like, I don't like to try things. And so I don't. I just eat a bland piece of chicken, and that's fine by me. I'm saying this because I heard a really cool illustration, a really good illustration. Um, There is an author, John Mark Comer, and John Mark Comer says that when he has been trying to get his kids to try new foods, he has to convince them to try it, not just for the first time, but just to keep coming back to it. Because the first time you try food as a kid, you hate it. It doesn't matter what it is. I do this all the time with my daughters. I'm like, try this. They try and they're like, no. I'm like, it's really good, I promise. But they have to keep coming back to it to develop a palate for it. You have to keep coming back to foods so that you can develop a palate for it. And what John Mark Comer is saying here is like, when it comes to the word of the Lord and delighting in the word of the Lord and meditating on the word of the Lord day and night, you can't just try it one time, like, I read the Bible, it wasn't for me, I'm moving on. You have to keep coming back for it and develop a palate for it because the word of the Lord is competing with everything else in the digital world. And one way he says that you can do this is by disciplining disciplining yourself to stop eating less of one thing and eating more of something else. And so for me, like, this is on like a physical level, like eating food, this is nearly impossible for me. Because it means I have to stop eating pizza and donuts and I have to start, start eating new things. And I'm like, that's just not going to happen. I don't really care that much. My wife's like, you should. But when it comes to the word of the Lord, we have to stop consuming everything else that the world is throwing out at us and we have to discipline ourselves to keep coming back to the word of the Lord day and night. See, that's where you find the blessed life is that when you do this constantly and methodically, so several years ago, I tried, I gave this a try. In, 2000, in January 1st of 2018, I decided that I was going to read the entire Bible in one month. Now, for those of you who read your Bible often, you know that there are some major downfalls to trying to do that. You can't really meditate on the word of the Lord when you have to read it all in a month. You are like in cruise mode. You're like, I got to get through. I was reading hours every single day so that I could read the entire Bible in a month. And it was cool on so many levels, but it does have its downfalls, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But here's what I discovered. After I read the Bible for 31 days, I read the whole thing through. Every single thing that I thought and I did in that month was focused on the Word of God. Man, I was just locked into Scripture day in and day out. My wife will tell you I was always sharing things with her about the Bible, almost to the point where she's like, Daniel, would you just stop talking about the Bible? I'm like, yeah, yes, sir. I couldn't make a joke unless it was a Bible joke. I couldn't have a thought unless it was a Bible thought. I couldn't even talk to my kids at this moment because all I could do was just like think about the Bible. And this is a really good thing actually because when you decide to plant yourself in the word of the Lord, it totally shatters your other plans. When you decide to delight yourself in the law of the Lord and spend time there in that, man, you discover the goodness of, of what God is doing in your life. And here's what happened. On the 32nd day of that year, I wasn't exhausted, I wasn't overwhelmed. And I picked my Bible back up. And when I picked my Bible back up, I started reading the Bible again. This time, a lot lot slower, a little bit more methodically, because I was just excited about getting back into Scripture. See, when you do this, when you make the decision to plant yourself in the Word of the Lord, to delight in it, to meditate in it, Eventually, you are like the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15, 16, who wrote, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Now, this is something good for your life. 
I love the image of the tree pictured in Psalm chapter 1. There's a lot of reminders in this, in this short psalm of how we can be like a tree. There it is, day after day, season after season, in all of the elements and of all of life, there is that tree planted by this life-giving source, by streams of water, planted by the word of the Lord, thriving in all it does, abundant in all it does. And I love this image. And if you really want to be like a tree, then you need to plant yourself in the word of the Lord, not later, today. Today you will make a decision for yourself and for your family that you're going to plant your life in the word of the Lord that you're going to allow the commandments of God to shape your life and that you're going to delight in who he is and what he is doing. You're going to meditate on it day in and day night, day out. This is how to be a tree. And I'm just going to tell you something. We need more trees here at Memorial Road. We do. We need more trees here at Memorial Road. We need people who have, are going to make the decision that they want to plant their life in the word of the Lord so that every blessing that comes out of this church is from the very words of God. Every good thing that we discover in our life is from the mouth of God. All of the goodness of life comes straight from his word. I'm just going to tell you something. The blessed person recognizes that the blessed life is not out these doors. The blessed life is when you give your life over to the word of the Lord. In fact, one of the greatest blessings that comes from that is that you get God. You get his presence in your life. You discover what the writer of Psalm chapter 16, verse 11 also discovered. He wrote, You, Lord, make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Because that's where blessing really comes from. I want to have, ask you to stand. I want to pray for you, and we're going to sing another song. I want you to know that while the abundant life is possible, it really does mean the total surrender of your life. And so I would just encourage you that if you're just like at a place where you're tired of every other path in your life right now, and you want to surrender your life something over to something that is good and fulfilling and thriving, man, we want to be here for you today and help you with that. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to sing this song. God, we love you. We thank you for the tree in Psalm chapter 1, the image of a life that is only found in your presence and in your word. God, help us to be like trees. In Jesus' name, amen.